Welcome to Better Worlds Ocean, where we dive into discussions on cutting-edge technology, data-driven solutions, and groundbreaking innovations aimed at tackling oceanic challenges. Join us as we ride the quest of a new era in global sustainability and work together to preserve our oceans for generations to come. Hello and welcome to Better Worlds, where we're talking about how data, technology, and innovation can improve our world and our ocean in particular. I'm Kate Wing, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Jessica Sandoval, part of the Ocean Discovery League. I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Dr. Sandoval, but I'm really excited to learn more about what you and your group are doing to explore the deep ocean and to engage more people in ocean exploration. Do you want to talk a little bit about your journey and what's led you to the work you're doing now? Yeah, sure, certainly. Uh, thanks for having me. This is a very exciting moment. Um, and yeah, journey to where my where particularly I am with the Ocean Discovery League. Um, we're a nonprofit that focuses on getting low-cost instruments, deep diving, deep sea instruments, out into the hands of, of many, as opposed to in the hands of few. Um, my personal journey getting here, I, uh, I worked for the past eight years or so in deep sea exploration, and um, that entails going to sea using these deep sea ROVs, which are multi-million dollar pieces of equipment that it, not only just for the machine itself, but also for the upkeep and personnel costs. Um, I've had the, the great privilege of flying those vehicles for eight years now. Um, but, you know, when you're not at sea uh, and you're back on land, you realize that not not most people don't have access to this technology, right? It's consolidated in the hands of few. Um, and so with Ocean Discovery League, we're trying to take this deep diving technology and get it out to more people. So right now we have the Makanu, which is one of our deep diving instrumentation. It's focused on imaging and getting temperature and pressure, um, but making that price point less than $1,000 for our users. And right now we're actually loaning it out to our users, so it's free. Um, so it's, it's quite nice because it creates this more holistic um, use of the ocean and also access to the ocean uh, instead of Again, being in the hands of so few people, we can actually start to have people explore their own backyards, their own deep waters. And uh, yeah, so that's what keeps me going. Can we, can we talk a little bit more about how hard it is to get to the bottom of the ocean? Because I think as someone who's done it so many times, it's important for people to understand just like that the ocean is huge and it's far away. And in order for you to go and send one of these robot ROVs down to the bottom of the ocean, like... What does that entail? First of all, you have to be at an institution that has a giant ship that can carry it, right? Like that's the first part is not everybody even has a giant ship to go out, right? Right. Yeah. Actually, most people, <laughs> most people don't have access to it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, certainly. So it's, it's a whole operation. It's an orchestra of people, right? Moving around. You have heavy machinery. So um, I myself am a certified crane operator. So you have to use large cranes. In order to get things over the side, you have to have um, a large winch in order to, you know, spool on and spool off this tether. You have to have depth rated tether, which means it has to go down to, you know, 4,000 meters, 3,000 meters, what have you, um, which is also big expense. So there's a lot of compounding factors of expense just from the, the large equipment, large machinery, the fact that it's... Um, highly specialized skill set also increases the cost. Um, so yeah, there, there are all these factors that compound and getting down to the bottom of the ocean, getting down to, to depth. Um, it's, it's a really fantastic journey going that far down. Um, there's really nothing like it once you are actually in that, that, you know, environment. Um, and yeah, we want to make sure that more people have access to explore that environment, you know, see these deep water corals, um, for their own interests or their own projects. Um, yeah. So a robot, like the one you would normally fly off of one of those big institutional ships, how much would one of those robots cost? Yeah. Yeah. One of those, one of the ROVs, um, upwards of a few million dollars. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just, you know, right off the bat, right? So you have the production cost of it, but then 
yeah, the, the personnel hours that work on maintaining the systems and that work on flying it. Um, and, and how big is it? Is it like a, a minivan? Is it like a, a giant tanker truck? How big is it? Yeah, yeah. I like minivans about the right the right size, yeah. Um, maybe a little bit shorter than a minivan, <laughs> but that's just for one of them. If you have a two-body system, you have double that. Um, a two-body system means that you have one ROV tethered to another one, and so you can have this soft tether in between, and then it separates out the dynamics of the ship with the ROV. Um, or else you can have a single body, which basically just means it's a one ROV going around with a long flexible tether. So regardless, they're million dollar pieces of equipment. They're very useful though. I, I can't, um, uh, be too harsh on my own field. They're very useful as well for, you know, doing a lot of really, I think, awesome work on manipulation, on sample recoveries, um, that's we have usually two ro- robotic arms, or we call them manipulators, that can take samples of things, fly around, get a lot of really nice imagery. Um, so the low cost alternatives is just getting people the basic tools to explore, and then ROVs are still really specialized for this underwater work. Um, and I'm just talking about the the science and exploration side. There's also a whole other side for industrial uses as well. So. Did you do the thing with the styrofoam cup that you sent down in ROVs that I know some of the East Coast folks do? So one of the things about exploring the deep ocean and part of why it's it's challenging, as you heard from Dr. Sandoval, that there's an expense involved. You have to have access to big equipment, but it's a very harsh environment. So you're 4,000 feet under the ocean and there's just hundreds and hundreds of pounds of pressure crushing down on you. And so there's this practice of sending a styrofoam cup, is it like a 16 ounce cup or an 18 ounce cup? What's what kind of like the kind of cup you'd get at a snack bar? Like it's yeah, like yay high. <laughs> it's it's uh, it really depends. It depends on your Costco run beforehand, I guess. But um, <laughs> <laughs> any styrofoam cup will do, but yeah, we, so you send it in and it starts out at about this big and then you let it get exposed, not you know, let, you let it get exposed to the pressure of the ROV because there's not a person in there because these aren't built to protect people from that pressure. So the cup goes in like this big and then it comes out like this big. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's super tiny. You make a little tea glass for yeah. nice, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like smaller than a shot glass. And I just think that's an amazing illustration of how challenging it is for us to understand this really remote and yet vibrant environment. So did you get to see things like deep sea thermal vents or, you know, Dumbo octopus. What are some of those favorite things you saw at the bottom of the ocean? Yeah. Oh, oh I have many. No, I, I have many. <laughs> we, would, we, would, we would be here for hours just talking about that. Um, <laughs> All right. Top three. Top three. Top three. Yeah. Um, okay. My, one of my top three, definitely hydrothermal vents, hands down. Actually, I it's still one of my favorite things. I write poems about this stuff still. Like, even when I'm on land, I just oh. I love it. <laughs> um, you have, like, the red lip tube worms coming out, you know, and I ah, love it. Just, yeah. So, highly thermal vents, top one. Um, top three, we also did a, some work on the USS Independence. So, this was a stalled ship uh, over in San Francisco Bay. And so, seeing all of the life that also in, in, encompassed and really took ownership of this of this ship um was stunning you had we, there was actually a hellcat the plane because this was an aircraft carrier actually in the in the ship while it was on the sea floor so that was that was a trip <laughs> and all these sponges growing over everything and these sponges are glass sponges so they're very delicate but they seem to really love making these beautiful sculptures on the sea floor that just encompassed that whole shipwreck. And not shipwreck, but called each ship. Um, yeah, that's probably number two. There's there's loads, yeah. I love seeing whale falls. Those are fun. Just seeing how life in, in kind of envelops everything or or cliffs underwater. Uh, everything has its own unique charm. Yeah, yeah. And while we're talking about the bottom of the ocean, let's let's take a moment to talk about your work with biomimicry, which is using natural systems to design 
new engineered ideas. Can you tell us about this idea for the sort of soft grip? I, I, it hadn't occurred to me until I saw the videos that the, your robots, you know, have giant robot kind of straight out of a cartoon robot hands that are very much claw-like and don't have a lot of fine muscle control. So when they go to pick up a, a soft, squishy organism from the bottom of the ocean, they just crush it because they only they only have two speeds. So what inspired you to go looking at a fish as a way to think about how to pick things up gently? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that. That's my whole, my whole PhD <laughs> research. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, so the, a lot of the concept around soft gripping was yeah, directly related to my work out in the field. Um, so we had the, the distinctive moment was me trying to pick up um, these really thin shell clams. This was like my second year out or something. And I was trying really hard to be very delicate and I squished two of them, two out of four. And I was uh, just not, not satisfied with that answer, you know, um, and so that kind of led to this concept of looking to soft gripping, um, which is a whole area of soft robotics is delicate manipulation. Um, and one way to really grab onto things underwater is by reversibly adhering to them or reversibly attaching, um, but without chemically binding to it. Um, and we see a lot of examples of this in air with gecko inspired adhesives. There's a whole field on this, but um, using these really small hairs, you will, to attach the things in air. Um, but really an equivalent underwater is with suction, suction cups and all. Um, but if you think of like a suction cup you use in your shower, those barely stick to the wall if they do, um, and they get impeded by cracks or roughness or whatnot. Um, and so looking for these alternatives, uh, there's a lot of natural solutions out there to things that stick onto irregular or rough surfaces. Um, and one of those is a fish <laughs> called a queen fish and it can hold 300 times its body weight. And, um, when it's, when it's dead too, you can use a queen fish to pick up a large rock and, um, it, it, there's some very interesting studies out there about this fish. I'm not, I'm not just going on the tide pools and picking up that fish. <laughs> we won't get me wrong. <laughs> um, anyway. How big is this fish? It's like this big? They vary. Yeah, there's some that are like some that are off the coast of Chile and those are large. And then there's some that are off the coast of San Diego where I did my, 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 my PhD and they're small. Um, and there's some of them in Washington with Adam Summers and they're a bit larger and yeah, there's a whole, whole range of them, but I probably should get back to the point uh, that they have these, <laughs> they have these little modified pelvic and pectoral fins that form these little suction cups on the, on their bellies. And, um, they're very intricate processes, but, um, spent, yeah, my PhD replicating those and then applying them to little grippers and soft grippers. And even I put one on a hockey puck and I was picking up eggs on the deck with a manipulator that I use for ROV deep sea work. So um, that's amazing that you can find solutions for challenges to explore the ocean from other ocean creatures, right? There's just so many things we can learn about life that's been adapting for millions of years in the ocean that can help us and other parts of ocean life. In our world. Yeah, certainly. There's um there's so many incredible so much incredible work out there too in this field. There's um muscles like the what you know you see the intertidal. Um the adhesive that they have that they use is now being applied towards the medical industry. So because it's biocompatible and can be used in within the body. Um so not just within the scope of ocean exploration, but also within the scope of medical internal use. <laughs> There's a lot of really cool, yeah, work out there with the bio-inspired sea life. Yeah. Yeah. So at some point if I cut myself, I could I could glue the cut back together with with muscle glue. Great. <laughs> it would be great if I could also grow muscles on that. That'd be tasty. Oh, that'd be good. You know, you'd always have a snack. <laughs> grow my own ecosystem. <laughs> all right. So here you've done this work. You're exploring all of these opportunities to learn from the ocean, to help us explore the ocean. And then you find your way to Ocean Discovery League. And you say, you know, what if these exploration tools didn't cost a million dollars? They cost a thousand dollars, which is a remarkably 
cheap approach to something that, you know, with orders of magnitude less expensive. So how do you take something so big and complicated and transfer it into a small adaptable piece of equipment? Yeah, yeah, certainly. A lot of it, um, so a lot with the sensors that we develop for ODO is, you know, what are the, the bare basics that people need? You know, do they need, um, in order to play it, for instance, you need Maybe you have access to a fishing boat, so you don't have access to these large, elaborate crane winch systems. So it has to be really easy to deploy. Um, a lot of our users right now are really interested in, in bruvs, these these baited traps underwater. Traps the wrong word, but um, basically a, cram- a camera system. And they have a, some food on the end of a stick, and you see what life is there. Um, so it, it really has opened my eyes a bit, too of what are the different options that people are using to explore their own um, deep water. So it doesn't need to be an ROV. As long as you have like an imaging system getting you pressure and temperature, that's what a lot of our users just want. They don't want something to necessarily fly around. That'd be great, but maybe they actually want to use it for these baited landers and whatnot. Um, but really a lot of the understanding that we that we use for a lot of the deep ocean exploration technology, these pressure housings, um, that really comes into play. So that uses that expertise. But a lot of the things that we do out in the field using wet mates, for instance, which are electrical connections that you um, need to not uh, get infiltrated with seawater. So these, these wet connections can actually be a point of failure for a lot of things we do out at sea. And so how do we build in, for instance, wireless connections that people don't have to worry about that wet mate connection. So basically lowering that technical threshold of our users um, is something that has been a very exciting um, engineering concept for myself. Um, And yeah, hopefully that will help broaden ocean exploration and participation on a much more global scale. And how did you figure out what people wanted? I mean, you did this kind of survey about what the capacity was out there and you surveyed people all around the world. So, I mean, what kinds of issues were people looking into where they said, these are the sensors that I want and this is why I need them? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that segue. Uh, So we did a a global deep sea capacity assessment back in, well, it was released in 2022. Um, but basically for that, it was looking to understand the needs of, of the, the countries, the territories that were surveyed um, and just, yeah, saying, is it visual data, which is kind of key and crucial, um, not only to understand the ocean, but also having a story to, to show people, right? Because we're very visual creatures. Um, but yeah, something as simple as getting CTD data, getting temperature, depth, like these are the basic parameters that were identified and that if, if they had access to would kind of um, not revolutionize, that's not the right word, but would help significantly with um, their own explorations and uh, their own research. Uh, so definitely visual data was one of them that was identified. Uh, temperature is another. Uh, CO2 and O2 is, is one that's gaining a lot of interest, especially with considering acidification, um, ocean acidification. Um, so yeah, so we're continually trying to develop more, more sensing modalities to kind of uh, keep up with this interest of our users and also the demand of what people will want out there. What kinds of things are you hearing from the Macaneo users once they get the sensors deployed in terms of, you know, what they need for their next steps in science or what kinds of training or other skills they could use to to go further once they can see what's on the bottom of the ocean next to them. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um well sorry. A lot of uh, a lot of our users they're super talented in in their field and um a lot of it has gone towards, you know, educating the next generation. So younger students, educating folks that aren't um, necessarily within the ocean exploration community immediately, um, but are great stakeholders, like um, getting involved with the fishing community. So a lot of our users have been trying to spread out the, the use of Makadu, um, which has been really exciting to see spread it out in the community. 
Um, and they're also very active in helping us, providing us feedback, um, saying, you know, this is what I would use this deployment for. This is the kind of design that I use currently. Um, so for this co-design process, which has been really, I think, fruitful and also getting them uh, an instrument that they can, that they will realistically use and have an ease of use for. Um, so it's been a really very um, productive, collaborative uh, design process. Yeah. Can you say any more about the types of communities that are really benefiting from this type of technology? You know, I think, you know, the ocean is a very large place, but it's unevenly studied. So as you know, having gone to school in California, which has a high concentration of institutions that have a lot of ocean capacity, it has a lot of those big boats, the West Coast of the US, Canada, Europe, there's a lot of that exploration capacity. But the Indian Ocean, which is very deep, and in some cases, drops off very steeply from the coastline, you need to be able to get into deep water pretty quickly. And people don't have that capacity. We know a shockingly little amount about the Indian Ocean, and, and similarly with parts of the Pacific around some of these Pacific Island communities where people are really dealing directly with the impacts of climate change. And so can you say more about what you're hearing from your users in those places? Because I know that's a space that you really tried to make connections and, and understand how you could help people see what's going on with the ocean around them. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful point to bring up. Um, yeah. So as, as we kind of touched on before, because ocean... Exploration ocean research has been heavily in the past historically kind of confined to the U.S., Canada, a lot of some Europe as well. Um, it's It's been a heavily skewed, if you will, data set of, you know, what is what is of interest in this, this concept of what is kind of colonial science as well. So people coming in, they do surveys and then they leave and then you don't necessarily... Um, develop those communities of practice in the in actual areas and waters that you were just surveying. So it becomes this very um, one-sided relationship, um, a bit more exploitative. Um, so yeah, so we're the communities that we're trying to engage with are, you know, trying to get the technologies into their hands so they can do their own explorations themselves. They don't have to rely on a ship coming from another part of the world. Um, and they can use it off their, you know, fishing vessels, maybe traditional vessels or um, whatever they have access to out there. Um, with regards to the communities, yeah, we we are trying to engage with users across the globe. So whether it's, um, well, I don't know if we should uh, not necessarily name drop where folks are, are deploying this from. Um, but yeah, we're really trying to get to these communities that are outside of this um, more heavily studied by only select group. Um, areas. So Pacific Islands is one. Um, we have some collaborators down with um, down in Hawaii, and also they they're kind of acting as our liaisons uh, throughout the Pacific Islands. Um, so it's been really helpful to make these connections and collaborations. Um, yeah, we also have collaborators within Seychelles or South Africa, and they've been really great at um, yeah, just really pushing the envelope and doing a lot of really exciting, productive. Uh, deep sea research within their own communities. So we're just hoping to get more and more users so that, you know, we can further, um, yeah, the research and exploration. What advice might you have for someone watching this who is wondering, well, I have a new technology or I have a new piece of software and, and I'd like to get it into the hands of these communities. I'd like to get it out there. Um, how can they get started connecting with these communities and building for them? And and are there particular needs where you're like, oh, I really wish someone would advance this thing? Yeah. <laughs> yes. There are many. There are both. <laughs> um, so a lot of the work, um, the, a lot of the foundational work for this is, was developing um, trust within amongst people that are stakeholders and users. Um, and that a lot of that legwork was also done by our founder, Katie. Um, and yeah, so building those communities of practice, communities of trust um, happened a bit early on when, when she was at MIT um, and doing a bunch of kind of deep sea uh, related workshops. Um, and then so that's how that community of initial users came together. Um, so for someone that is you know, excited about getting a technology out there. Um, 
I would probably say, yeah, just look for conferences in which there's like-minded individuals coming to, um, ideally virtual ones, right? Because not everyone has the funds to go far, <clears throat> rather not has the funds to travel far. Um, but everyone can, on this virtual platform that we now have, can go to conferences anywhere in the world. Um, so that's one great way to, to start these relationships. Um, and with regards to technology that we would want to see developed, um, oh, there are so many. One up and coming thing is eDNA. So that's um, kind of in the hot, hot ticket and talked about. And there's a lot of different barriers to entry for this, um, especially because the post processing of genetic material is very um, expensive. Um, so solutions to so something like an eDNA sampler that also processes your samples and can um, well, be easily distributed. That's uh, something that'll be exciting. And I don't know low cost alternatives to this yet. I'll be excited to see that. Maybe that's just a, a bias in my own end. But um, yeah, it, can tells you, it tells you a lot without getting the visual data of things. So yeah, that'd be great if everybody could have pocket eDNA <laughs> samplers to see what's been swimming by their coastline and well, you know, or, or attached to their Macanu to see what's living down at the depths. We can dream about that world. We can dream about it. Yeah, I would love to dream about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> or write poetry about it, at least. That's true. You know, in our dreams. <laughs> so, I mean, you do also write children's books, right? Yeah. About the ocean? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I find the things that we see are just out of this world. So um, that's where it all comes from is just you see... I don't know, you see X, Y, Z number of things out on the seafloor and, and it inspires me to write ridiculous poems about them, about hugging hagfish or, I don't know, just <laughs> things that keep me entertained at sea. Also, I hope entertains, um, you know, kids especially. Well, I think it's fantastic that you want to take these creatures and habitats and worlds that so few people actually get to see and make them more easily seen either by people who read your poems or your books or by people who use low-cost technology to go out and explore the ocean. So I want to thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. And for people who want to tech, check out Dr. Jessica Sandoval's work, she's with the Ocean Discovery League. And you can search for her name as well on the web to see pictures of soft robot clips picking up crabs and other creatures from the ocean floor. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll see you on the next Better Worlds Ocean podcast.